Hi, we're Shannon and Jerry Arner. And our dog, Betty White. Your hosts of the Arner Adventures podcast. Could we have named it something more creative? Probably. But it's the name of our blog. It's our last name. We're on an adventure. Yada, yada, yada. After running our own business, working 24-7. And don't forget a mental breakdown in between. We made a lifestyle change and decided to make the most out of life. We sold our house, most of our belongings, downsized, and moved to the coast. We live life minimally, but fully. We live each day as an adventure. This show will help you learn how to live life more fully, with more intention, by experiencing more, and with less stuff. We'll talk about our own experiences, interview others who have much to share by creating a spark in our lives. Some days we'll share real life ongoings of what we're going through and others will talk about our favorite flavor of waffle. Come join our adventure. It's It's the the Arner Adventures Adventures Podcast. Podcast. Hello everyone, I'm Jerry. And I'm Shannon. Betty White is here with us and we're back for episode 19 of the Arner Adventures podcast. Well, we are excited to be back with a guest episode. We call this series Spark in Our Lives because the guest has been a spark in our lives in one way or another. And today's guest has truly been that and we cannot wait to introduce her to you. But before we get to our guest, let's get to the review of the week. Today's review comes from Naeem H. And Naeem says, love the show. So many great tips. We thank you so much, Naeem. We're trying to be helpful and our guests are always providing helpful takeaways too. So we love hearing that feedback. Yeah, we do. And if you'd like to be our review of the week and get the chance to receive a gift from Sugar Wish, please take a moment and give us a five-star review or rating. We have an easy link for you all to follow. It's lovethepodcast.com slash Adventures. But no worries. We'll link it for you in the show notes. It helps us so much to support us in that way and keeps us pumped up and motivated. While you're at it, be sure to hit that subscribe button in the platform you're listening to us on. Be sure to be notified each time we have an episode drop. Well, let's get to today's episode. Today's guest is a remarkable woman. Her name is Amicia Williams. We talk about our encounter and how we met in the episode, but we mainly wanted to share a few things before we get started. First of all, this episode can be triggering for some of you if you have been through any trauma, abuse, or sexual assault. Amicia discusses having experienced such events in her life, so I just wanted to make sure that we put that out there. Second, With that being said, Amicia's story is one of resilience, one of triumph, and it's going to give you chills at times in the most positive way. I could go on, but let's just get to the episode and let you meet her for yourself. I am so excited to welcome our guest today, Amicia Williams. I met Amicia at the end of last year, which would have been 2021. My mom and I were at this work event for my mom's business. We were in Charlotte for this ungodly amount of time. That could be a whole other episode. But for, I think it was like a two-week span, three weeks, something like that. But trade show of sorts. And we met Amicia day one. And you know how there are people that you meet sometimes and you hit it off. But this was different. My mom and I met her briefly. Of course, we hit it off. Amicia has this aura about her that is so enlightening and so bright and it just radiates. And I was just telling her before we started recording that, you know, we talk about mental health on this show a lot. When you meet people who have this sort of motivating nature about them and we don't even know her and we immediately felt it and she walked away. We'd only known her for about five minutes and we immediately said, wow, she just has this energy about her that's so positive. And so fast forward to now, we're going to have a show talking about it, but fast forward to now, when we were talking about people that we have on the show, and of course, this series is called Spark in Our Lives, we have wanted to have her on the show. And I was so excited when she said yes. I'm so happy to welcome Amicia. Thank you for being here today. Yay. (laughs) Thank you so much, Shannon, for having me. I talked to you when I met y'all. You guys felt like family. (laughs) I was the black sister. (laughs) You guys immediately felt like family. And so I assume the energy that I'm around. And so I felt like. Well, that's really Y'all were my people. And, you know, it's interesting because at the end of that time, you were calling my mom, mama, too. And it was the sweetest thing. And I just. my baby. (laughs) And then fast forward a week later, we were at this other event in Raleigh. And you were at that event too. Oh, yeah. 
And so we just connected and now we follow each other on social media, support each other's businesses and social media and all of that. So, and now Jerry also shares my account. So he follows you. And so we have both been saying we need to have you on the show. So we're just so excited that you're here. And I'm so excited. Now our community gets to know who you are on social media. I'm your sister. Hello. <laughs> I know. Your family. Your second, third daughter. Uh-huh. I'm finally going to kind of get around to why you're so wonderful. So first of all, you're a busy lady. I'm just thankful for your time. I want to talk about, first of all, your background. You were obviously working the side hustle. You were doing that, but you have your own business. So if you don't mind telling us about your business and how you got started in that and just a little bit about all that. Okay. So it's really interesting because I grew up traditional Southern. So education was major. It was equated to religion and our Mm -hmm. way of life. And so my background is education. I spent 10 years as a teacher and then I decided to go into the mind psychology. What made me go into psychology was Columbine. I just, that bothered me so bad. Even though my concentration was education and I was working as a teacher, And I just remember looking at my students and just thinking, because I was young, I was like 20. I remember thinking like, one day, one of these kindergartners may decide to, you know, shoot up a school. Mm. And so I then began to think about like, what could lead up to that? Like, and then it just kind of made me think about my own life and how abuse is not always apparent how you may not can always look at a child and tell that they are being abused. And oftentimes by the time you recognize the abuse, it's out of control. Right. And so for me, I was a victim of molestation over and over again and then rape. And so mentally I was already just like, I was already a little mental. Then I got married young and I brought that mental issue into my marriage. And so around about 23 or 24, I went back into school for educational psychology. It was around that time that I had a miscarriage. So maybe a couple of years later, two years later, I had a miscarriage and that miscarriage flatlined me. So we got divorce, miscarriage, death experience, rehab. And so it was in the rehabilitation I kind of like began to see life differently. I kind of like started to see myself the way others saw me. And they did not see me the way you met me. (laughs) They saw me on the extreme opposite end of that scale, you know. Right, right. I was this young, angry, upper middle class, entitled little bitch. Right. I had money and education and I had references. And so I did not have to be nice. And I was not. Hmm. I was not nice. In the Black community, in not every family, but in certain ones, it's kind of celebrated to be curt. Who could be the most curt? Who could be the most nice, nasty? Who could serve the hardest? You know, and it's kind of celebrated, especially by the elders when you can chew one a new one, you know what I'm saying? Without Mm -hmm. bending yourself out of shape. It's like, oh, you did that. You know, you're celebrated when you can keep your cool, but kind of, you know, insult someone or whatever. And so I had become a master at that. And that had become one of my faces, one of my reps. That's who I was. So I started (laughs) hanging out with these bad grown up women and traveling or whatever. And I started dating the guy that I'm with now. Just really enjoying life. Then I found out I was pregnant and I was devastated. Oh my God, I was so devastated because I had just gotten a divorce. Okay. And I didn't want to be pregnant and single. And that was crazy to me. And then my family, again, Southern, you know, judgy. Yeah. You know, yep. You so you couldn't get pregnant when you was married. Now you divorced. Now you a baby mama. Yeah. You know, um, I just, to embarrass my dad was the worst. Yeah. But it was what it was. You know, I was pro, you know, life until I was pregnant. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, I don't want it. Yeah, I think but I couldn't, yeah. And I couldn't bring myself to get rid of it. 
And so that's when I realized that, you know, women deserve a choice because, you know, it's not your business and it's not your body. You know, you don't know what kind of agreement me and this person has. And I didn't want that, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So anyway, I ended up miscarrying. And mm. that was what really changed my life. Because when I came to, you know, I mean, once I rehab out of it, I just began to see life differently. I began to understand. I already could understand on an empathetic level. But it seemed like I could understand, like, the actual mechanics. I, I could see, like, into that person's situation. And I could see how. You in school for psychology at this point? I was out of school. So you I had already been to school. Okay. I was in my last year at Mercer when I miscarried. Okay. I feel like when you said you went to school for psychology... Things are clicking for me now of who you are. Like now I'm going, oh, that's where this is coming from. Because now Very I'm like, cerebral. yeah, you are. Very, I'm a thinker. But see, the things that I've been through in life up to this point, the molestations, growing up Christian, you know, my dad was not a Christian. My mom was. And so my dad was estranged from his family. So the only family we had outside of our core parents were my mom's family so my right. mom's family was devout christian and my dad was i don't even know what to call it my daddy was i mean nowadays it would be called spiritual but you know my daddy he was just you know i used to be like lord please don't strike it down he don't mean it god he don't mean it you know, God, please don't kill my dad. He didn't mean it. <laughs> he said the crazy stuff when I was a kid. So my parents were total opposites. So I had my mom in the doctrine of the religion of Christianity. And then I had my dad. And then I had all of these terrible things that happened to me in childhood. You yeah. know, when I knew for a fact that I was innocent. And so for me where it becomes mental was just trying to maintain my sanity and trying to understand how at seven I deserved molestation, oh. how at 18 months I deserved molestation. How is that God? You know, mm -hmm. it was just very yeah. difficult for me as a child to process that. I just could not accept it. I just, you know, it was very difficult for me. So I had to try and understand some adult shit and I did. You know, I just said, well, maybe, you know, God needed me to understand this for people who couldn't. Maybe I needed the experience to be able to communicate, you know, that this experience is something that has happened, but it does not, you know, necessarily dictate who you are. And I mean, this is an understanding I had as a child with the secret of being molested Shit. by my uncle, because that was a secret until I was 16. If you don't mind me asking, was your family supportive of you did, were they aware when i was 16 so when i turned i was almost 17 when i was raped that brought traumatic dreams and the dreams is what brought the memory of the molestations gotcha and so when i started remembering i would go to my mom and so i think what it was was the earliest memory that I was dreaming was like, I was like 15, 16 months old. And so for my mom, it was like, how do you remember that? Like you were a baby. Like that was a lifetime ago. You're like 17. But I was seeing it happen every, I was telling her, mom, I can't wow. sleep because every night I'm having the same dream. Wow. And she was like, well, what is the dream? And I was telling her, I'm dreaming that I'm on a changing table and a lady is trying to mess with me and Scooby-Doo is on the TV. I was telling her my sister was in the bathtub. I could see her from the changing table. And I said, you spent the person around. And next thing I know, you were outside and you had them pinned against the wall and it was a brick wall and you had a bottle, a broken bottle to their neck. I remember that I saw that. And she was like, oh my God. She was like, well, this is what happened. I came to the babysitter to pick y'all up early. And the lady who was watching y'all's granddaughter was schizophrenic. And I caught her messing with you. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. 
And she was like, Nisi, I almost went to jail that day. She said, I had to remember that she was just a child. But the fact that I saw her bothering you, I, you know, so they sent me to Atlanta and this was in Florida. They sent me to Atlanta to live with my grandmother. And that's when my uncle began to molest me. Oh my God. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So I was about five. That so is- it was the memories of that walking around with that anger mm-hmm, and the I- trauma and then the things that it did to my actual body, you know, not understanding what's wrong with my private area, but understanding that something is wrong and then still at the same time being too afraid to tell my mom. Mental wellness is something we talk a lot about here on Our Adventures, which is great. It should be part of the daily conversation. Mental wellness is important. We wanted to share a resource that we love, have used, and refer to others, and is a game changer in helping you find a therapist to match your specific needs. Full transparency, I remember being at one of my lowest points a few years ago, desperate for help, needing a therapist who had a specific skill set. I'd been calling around, Googling, trying to make a connection with someone who could help me. No one understood the level of grief I was experiencing. And when I finally called my local crisis and assessment center, thinking they could help me, I couldn't get help there either. Here's the thing. Finding a therapist should not be this difficult. We have found a wonderful resource that takes all of the difficulty away from matching you with a therapist to fit your specific needs and preferences. It's Mental Health Match. Mental Health Match literally takes the stress out of finding a therapist by answering just a few questions. It's free to use, takes minutes, and is the easiest way to find a therapist. You can choose therapy approaches, topics to tackle, skills you want to learn, and if there are traits about a therapist that are important to you, you can choose those too. If price is a concern, you can choose insurance, no insurance. You can search that route as well. You can also find therapy options for in-person or virtual. Once you have your therapist matches, you can choose whether or not you want to share your information or contact them on your own. Like I said, I've used this. We've shared this with friends and family who have used this option. It's such an easy process. We encourage you to give it a try. Finding someone to talk to is so important in maintaining mental wellness. Visit mentalhealthmatch.com to find a therapist that is the best match for you. It's the easiest way to find a therapist. And so do you think that, I mean, you're more educated about this than I am. I'm not, not at all about psychology. Do you think that that's where all that anger was coming from that you were holding like all those years? I had a stay-at-home mom, and my grandmother was retiring by the time I was, like, maybe 12. And so my grandmother was a school teacher. My mom went to school for education. All my aunties. And so for me, we had a very controlled living environment. I mean, when I say controlled, like, they knew what you were thinking, okay? Yeah. Like, you couldn't even have a private <laughs> them animals knew what you was thinking. Do you hear me? <laughs> and so for me, being the second born... And, you know, just being a natural observer and being a prisoner of my thoughts, it was very hard for me to understand how my mom, who knew everything, could not tell that her brother was fucking with me. That is, I think that is where the anger came, the resentment came. I see. I see. Because you know everything else. How can you not see the difference in your child? Like, I wasn't 12. I was seven. Right. So... I remember now looking back, you know, I remember experiencing what one would call a yeast infection as a little girl. Yeah. And being so afraid to tell my mom because I was more scared of like my dad. Like my daddy would probably kill my uncle and end up in jail. So I was afraid of just the reverb. Thank you for sharing all that. I can't even imagine. I think what's hard for me to imagine is, and I haven't even known you that long, but it's like you're that person that I just described having gone through all that. You know, when I became a school teacher, I started trying to identify sexual abuse in children that may have come from my background because by all appearances, I was perfect. I was an honor roll student, straight A's, principal's list, and all honors classes. I mean, dressed well, hair always combed. I did not fit the description. I did not look like the type of child that was going through things like that at home. 
I was given three meals a day, snacks. Once the Columbine thing hit me, yeah, that's when my mind went from these children don't need a teacher. They need a confidant. They need someone that they can talk to. They need unbiased ears. They need support. These kids are hurting and nobody is listening. I started reading this book called Getting the Love You Need or Getting the Love You Deserve or something like that. I can't even remember the psychologist that wrote the book. Once I was going through my separation, the reaction that I got from my friends and family members was not one of, oh man, I'm so sorry for you. They were more like, oh, I know he's happy. Oh, I know he's somewhere breathing easy. Oh, child, I know he, and I was just like, <laughs> right. I just didn't understand that. And, <laughs> right, and I mean, I'm talking about close friends and family. Like, these weren't strangers. Oh, my God. And so God. it made me begin to ask people, how did they see me? You know, well, do you think I'm a bad person? Because he cheated on me. I didn't cheat. Everybody had similar answers. They were like, well, you're nice, but you're, you're a bitch. Well, you cool, but, you know, if you don't get your way, then you blow up on people, you know. Or you cool, but, you know, you go from zero to 100, and it's very unpredictable. And so that was the opposite of what I thought, you know, people were getting from me. I thought, you know, I was this kind, bubbly, generous, lovely energy and here I was this monster you know dressed up like a kitten you know and so that's what really made me start working on me more which is like wow this is what people are experiencing right and that was not my intention what got me was religion that is what I will say ultimately crossed me on over into being an ultimately better person 27, I opened up my first salon in this city called Hateville, which is where our airport sits. It's a historic district, beautiful area. I opened up my first brick and mortar. I was so excited. I used cash money to do it. And again, Southern Baptist, you know, I've been married and divorced. So now it's time to get married again. And I'm like, okay, I got a business. I got a house. It's time to get married again. It's time for me to get my life right, get my life to the Lord. You know, my dad had since passed and things of that nature. So it's time to, you know, move forward. So I joined this church, Shannon. Even though I was raised in ministry, I mean, in church, I've never had to do anything in church, but go, you know, I had to go. Thinking back, I remember my mom always making it a big deal about not making me do anything in the church. And I, Back then as a kid, I used to be like, my mama, no, I ain't with that. You know, <laughs> I used to think that was it. But once I got in the ministry and I saw for me how things go or were going, I knew that I could not align myself with that. Yep. It just reminded me of high school. Yep. It reminded me of people coming to, you know, be liked. And I'm very clear with my wording. I'm very clear with the ideals that I'm projecting. It's not yep. muddied at all. And I never, ever go anywhere seeking friendship. I'm never looking for friends. Yeah. I've never been the type to gain friends. That's why when I do, it's so genuine. Yeah. Because I, it's authentic. But I've never really been extra received by people. So I'm right. not looking for that. I came here for God. I came here for a closer relationship. I came here to know what the next step was so I can get married and move on. I joined the ministry and they were pressing me to hold office. And I have a gift. And my gift is the ability to read people. I can read people like the back of my hand. I've always been able to. When I had the death experience, it's just been exemplified. It's just amazing how well... I can read energy and thoughts, even emotions, or how easily I can pick up on things that people have been through, especially things that are similar to what I've endured. I think I kicked myself the most for the length of time that I was into this situation with this church. But one day, Shannon, one Sunday, 
the pastor gets up and says that I should close my salon and move 40 minutes away to a city called Buford. In the service industry, location is everything. But aside from location, you don't ever want to stray too far from where you began business if you want your core clientele to right to stay. I did not move. I did not agree with it. I felt like if God had something to say to me that God would have told me first, or at least at some point. <laughs> at least God, at some point, God would have told me. I mean, honestly. Right. I'm, why, isn't he, why isn't he giving you a heads up? Exactly. And so that was my argument. And at this point, my whole family was in this church. Now, not my aunties and uncles, but my mom and my siblings, nieces and nephews. And so I don't have any kids and I'm not married. And so, you know, it's just me and my mom and my siblings and their kids. And so at the time, I was really anxious that I was going to lose my family because this was all that I had. And they could not see what I could see. I began seeing things and hearing things and that were later confirmed by people who, you know, were not with me when I was having these impressions. So I left the church. Oh, but before I left the church, I lost everything. This pastor has his armor bearer come and move me out my salon. Shannon, move me out my house. What? Yes, yes, yes. In the church, he stood in the pulpit flat-footed and said that God says for me to move and I need to be where money is and there isn't any more money in the airport area. That area is dead. And if I really believed God, then I would have moved when he first gave the word. With what money? What? Yes, I'm not lying to you. So he sent his armor bearer to my salon. I pleaded with my mom. I was like, mom, this isn't right. This doesn't make sense. This does not make sense because where am I going to go? Like, where am I going to live? So at that point, that Sunday, I became homeless. And I was homeless for five years. Oh, my God. <laughs> five years. I was raised in the church. So tithing and offering was something that I was raised doing. So let's say your tithe is 10%. So 10% of my earnings would be sometimes $800, $900 a week. And then my offering had to be above that. So my weekly, then, you know, Wednesday, they want an offering. Then they need a love offering and it's every week. So was he then helping you find home since he then moved you out of your salon? No, no. His answer was that I move in with this young couple that was what? in the church. And that's what? when I knew that it wasn't right. I told my mom. Ever since I was a kid, my grandmother always was adamant about, you know, if you're in a relationship with someone, never moving people in with you, ever moving in with a couple because of the energy that it would bring. And so when they told me to move in with this young couple, I instantly got alarmed because that went against my upbringing. And I was just like, so mom, so I got to live with these people that just got married. My question is, and I'm assuming a lot here, is that this pastor must have had some underlying thing for this, right? Like, what was his real meaning behind having you move out of there? Shannon, I am going to be guessing, but I would say this church was more in line with a cult. Okay. And I would say that this guy was a master at siphoning the energy of the people in his congregation. Okay. And so I think that I was a resource for them. And I think that my salon and my home was too far for them and they needed me closer so that they can siphon more money off of me. Okay. Religious manipulation. I questioned a lot, you know, like, is this how you get closer to God? You know, and it really made me, when I left religion altogether, it really upset me because of my level of intelligence. You were able to manipulate me, not into thinking that you could get me into heaven, but by thinking that, you know, you 
were so much more chaste than I was, you know, because, you know, we went through a lot. Like I was a vegan for years. I didn't eat meat. I did not eat meat byproducts. I didn't. I closed my salon on Saturdays. I observed the Shabbat, the Sabbath. I did not eat chocolate. I did not eat candy. I did not convene with people who were not, quote unquote, righteous. Is your family still in the church? No, they all left after me. But you talk about a nervous breakdown. I had a nervous breakdown when I left. And it's primarily because church was what we were taught. So everything that I came to know was centered around this faith that I had. Even the death experience, you know, during the death experience, I saw myself in my casket and I woke up. So I understood that I had some form of control over actual death. And like we all do, you know, we don't just die by mistake. Like we have some form of control over whether we wake back up on this side or not. And so I remember thinking, no, like, no. And I woke up in a hospital. So in this church, I began to think, you know, these situations with with spirit and with the afterlife, this is personal. This has nothing to do with a congregation or a group. This has everything to do with how you personally live your life and what you personally feel you deserve out of life. And I, I feel like, you know, the energy that we consider to be God is going to give us the desire of our heart as long as it aligns with our greatest good. And so shortly after that, I began traveling with the makeup brand that you saw me with. Yeah. I was out of ministry, but I was learning love and self-love, love of self, I was beginning to understand that God was an internal entity or an internal being and that that internal being had its existence through all things that lived. That's what helped me with my interpersonal skills with white people, Southern Black. Yeah. We're, especially in Georgia, we were intentionally segregated. You know, we naturally segregate, not, you know, we're forced. It's just natural. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of experience around groups of white people that is not controlled. I had white kids. My my first friend was a white girl. My first male friend was a white boy. You know, they were the only white kids in my school, but they were my friends. But it was never a situation until I went to high school where I was the minority. And that was hard. I had never experienced that. Right. I couldn't do it. And so that's when I realized that I might have had some type of a problem. I wasn't aware of it, but I focused on it. It's like God kept putting me in situations where I was like, right, we like, right, I mean, like, right next to a white lady or a white (laughs) man. Every time, every flight, every flight. I mean, and um, my goddaughter moved to California for like five years. And so I had to fly out there every month and every flight I was sitting next to a white person. And when I say they were the kindest people, (laughs) so I began asking myself, Shannon, I started saying, well, God, why do you keep sitting me next to all these white people now? (laughs) Now, you know, and it was literal. Now, I always attracted white men. White men have always been attracted (laughs) to me. But white women. I've it's either been either business, either I've been teaching the kids, or, you know, it just never really was a response. I mean, a relationship. And so I'm being set by these beautiful women, and we're having these lengthy conversations. We, I mean, they showing me their kids, grandkids. I mean, you know, and this happened for years. And I asked Spirit, I was like, God, you know, I just think I'm the God. Whisper, God, why you keep sitting me next to these white people? And I felt like spirit came back and spirit said, because I need you to know that it's not skin specific. It's blood specific. You will know me by the spirit. You will know my people, not by the way they look, but how they feel. That's how we got here. Y'all felt like me. Oh, I just got chills. Y'all did. I was like, man, they're my people. I don't care what nobody say. They're my people. (laughs) I just got chills. Like, I have chill bumps all over me. Oh, 
It's because you're my people, Shannon. <laughs> One of my questions for you was, where do you get that energy from? Like, where do you get that all that positive energy from when there's so much negativity in the world? And I had no idea that you were going to have had experienced all this negative stuff. But when I learned that you could transmute energy, I learned that maybe three years ago. So I'm not like, you know, my dude probably, I mean, he just asked me the other day, was I crazy? So, you know, you see here, you think I'm great. And <laughs> you think I might need to be checked in somewhere. <laughs> well, I mean, but, I feel like, you know, I'm only seeing like what you're putting out on social media, right? But I feel like, yeah, there are days that I can tell you're fed up with shit, right? Yes. You're, you're definitely fed up with shit, but it's almost like you're fed up with shit, but here's how you're going to handle it. I feel like you have solutions and you're like, here's how I'm going to handle shit. But I don't feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of people put things out that are like, fake it till you make it. I don't feel like it's like that with you. Am I wrong? You don't feel like it's like that with me because you got to experience me. So, yeah. you know, in those two weeks that we spent in Charlotte and that week in Raleigh, you got to see me like super energized and you got to see me super drained. You got yeah. to see me on my birthday. You got to see me yeah. pissed off. Yeah. So... You got to see me in lights where I really could, if I wanted to hide my true emotion, I couldn't because we were there for so long. Yeah. The truth would have just eventually come out yeah. anyway. But when I crossed over into the spiritual realm in 17, 2017, one of the things that I learned was that I don't have power over anything but myself. And matter of fact, that man was given dominion over everything but man. So in everything that I can effectuate or change, I cannot change or effectuate another human being. I can't do that. So, you know, I used to have an issue with my hair falling out because of stress when I was like 20. And my stylist, which was my sister, she would tell me, you have to release things that you cannot readily or immediately change because it's going to change you if you don't. And so I learned that the things that I cannot control back then that I released. But I've since learned that I can control everything that affects me. All I have to do is know how to word it. So okay. I may not be able to control you liking me, right? But right. I can control what you see of me that you may dislike. When you were really stressed and your hair was falling out, and I'm asking you this because I told you when I was suffering from depression and all that, my hair was falling out and my nails were falling off. I mean, it was terrible mm -hmm. so when all that was happening. And I think now, like sometimes when I have really stressful anxiety times, I can tell like my hair will start to fall out. Uh -huh. So when you're having those moments and you're rerouting, are you changing your self-talk? Is that what you're saying? That's right. I am. That's exactly right. I first recognize that I'm thinking about something that is beyond my immediate control, like the weather. Yeah. And then how I transmute a rainy day is by giving thanks for the sun. So it's like a gratitude, like you're Period. practicing gratitude. Because what I found out is most times when you are trying to be positive or believe God or the universe or keep your mindset align with a certain thing, then the distractions will always come to oppose it because that is their job. Their job is to be an opposing force. Your job is to hold on to what you know you deserve. It's not to focus on the opposer that it's job to oppose. For me, my hair was falling out when I was a school teacher. I would take on the stress of my classroom and I would bring it home with me. I had to learn that I could not take on that stress. I had to release that every day at 3.30. But it didn't mean that I released my kid. It just meant that my job was over at 3.30. Now, I can think positive thoughts about my kids, know that they're fine, and I can let that go. But anything that you're doing, there's going to always be a set of conditions to come against it to see if you really believe that you deserve what you are believing for or working towards.
know what I love about water? Well, other than living by it. Well, there are a million things to love about water. The sea life, the healing properties, part of the Earth's okay, atmosphere. Okay, all that, but I love drinking water. Well, of course, but did you know that humans can only live a few days without water? Yes, yet so many people live a dehydrated lifestyle. Well, Liquid IV makes it super easy to stay hydrated. Hey folks, Liquid IV isn't scary. There aren't any IVs involved. No, Liquid IV is a hydration multiplier. It's a powder form, an electrolyte mix that you just add to your water. It delivers two to two and a half more hydration than water alone. They have all kinds of flavors you can choose from, and they have some with energy multiplier and immune support. Also benefit, they are non-GMO, gluten-free, soy-free, and dairy free. If you're someone who either has trouble getting your water in or maybe just wants to get in the express lane with your hydration, you should definitely try Liquid IV. For our listeners, if you go to their website, liquid-iv.com and use code ARNERADVENTURES, you can save 25% off of your order and get free shipping. That's awesome. We'll link it in the show notes too. Liquid IV, fueling life's adventures. How did you end up getting back on your feet with your business? You know, beauty was an image-based thing. Yeah. And I charge a lot of money for my services. And my clients have been with me for 20 years. Yeah. And so they saw me fall. They saw me not have places to service them. They saw me working from this person's home, working from that person's home. I was so broke. I could not, after I rented the salon suite, I could not afford to lease a space anymore i had lost the clientele and i was just depressed a friend of mine she was at the show with me her name is kanisha she's younger than me and she will always be like amicia 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 just always like a little butterfly flying around and she'd be like amicia you should do this you should do that and i was like girl that is not enough money honey listen baby i charge okay listen to me honey they listen they can't buy my lunch okay (laughs) trust me they can't and so for two years she would come to me with this opportunity. And one day I was over to her to get my hair done. I ain't had no money. I was like, I need my hair done. I ain't got no money. She was doing my hair and she was like, well, the makeup team is looking for another artist. I know you said it ain't no money, but bitch, you broke. <laughs> and she said it just like that. She was like, you broke. You can take it. You know you need it. <laughs> so I was like, well, how much she charging, Kyle? You know, how much she paying, Kyle? You know, this is how much I charge, and these are the amount of hours I'm willing to work. And I'm not, you know, I'm running down my list, not, you know, like I'm not sleeping on the floor at night. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm running down my list. Do you hear me? Like, I am not sleeping on the floor. Because you know your worth. You know your worth. And she's like, well, I forwarded your information and your social site over to the lady. This is her name. She's going to reach out to you. So the lady reached out to me that week and she asked me what my rates were and I told her and she asked me, you know, a little bit about myself. And then she gave me the show schedule, which her schedule ran from February to November. And she was like, if you are available, you know, I would need need you for all these shows. And she was doing shows like three weeks out per month. She was paying for everything. So she was paying for flight. For them, she was paying for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Airbnb, and then she paid uh, for the actual show, which was good because I literally didn't have anywhere to live. I was going to say, you would have a comfortable bed. So were you acting like you weren't really that excited about it? So the behind the scenes was I was living with my cousin who was about to have a baby. And I had began practicing writing out my affirmations. And one of the affirmations that I wrote out was, I am a world traveler. I can show it to you in my notebook. Oh, and so, my God. And I'm a money man. The large sums of money come to me easily, effortlessly, and often. And so those were two of my main 2017, 2018 affirmations. So in 2017, I took the job with Shanna. I worked with her. I traveled, of course, as you know, all over the United States. Yep. 2018, I went to Mexico for a week on my own time. 2020, she called me. This was the year before, whatever the year was before COVID. Yeah. She calls me and she's like, Amicia, I need to go to my country for my birthday or whatever. 
and she's like, I need somebody to run my store. So at this point, I had vowed never to work in any other salon ever. I didn't care if I had to do your hair in your trunk. I was not renting a chair because that was beneath me. <laughs> and um, But I was fond of Shanna from the first trip. I was fond of her. I didn't feel sorry for her, but having run a business for so long, having had to do payroll, having had people depend on you, their paychecks, and then have people not appreciate your sacrifice. I understood that. I saw that. I saw people abuse her product. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, sure. What you need me to do? She was like, you know, my store in New Jersey, I need you to go and I need you to run it for Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and I'll pay you all this money. I was single. I was still, you know, unhappy or whatever. And I was like, yeah, why not? You know? And I was all on this thing where I had told myself that was the year before I had went to Mexico on my own. And I told myself that I was going to start living. I was going to stop waiting on people to go with me. I was going to stop waiting on the right amount of money to travel. I was just going to start doing it ever since I started traveling with her. The first trip, her store was in Woodbury Mall in Woodbridge, New Jersey. And it was a total culture shock. New Jersey is nothing like Atlanta, but it was a very comfortable environment because I stayed in her home. And then over the holidays, she sent me out to the Bellagio in Atlantic City. And then she put me up in Brooklyn for Christmas. The day that I walked into her store, my heart dropped into my boots. Because her makeup store was set up like a hair salon, and I was instantly convicted. I said, when I get to Atlanta, the first thing I am going to do is open up. So I left there in December. The I was supposed to say to New Year's, but, you know, I'm a little crazy. So my mind started saying, if you leave now, you're going to die. So I had to leave. I told her, I said, I'm so sorry. I know I told you I would stay to New Year's, but I have closed your store. I am on the road. Like, it was like 12 o'clock in the day. (laughs) Is she okay with that? Well, I mean, if she wasn't, she was going to get okay with it because I was gone. It was over with. And I've been my own boss for too long to ask for permission. Goodbye. Get somebody to come in. I don't know what else to tell you. So I left. And I came home. And I did not have any clients, Shannon. But I started looking for a space and I got a phone call from my high school, a longtime high school friend, wanted her hair done, invited me to come do her hair at her space. She owned a salon suite. Okay. She was like, well, you know, I've been had this building for a hundred years and, you know, I'm just tired of it. You know, just do my hair. I just, you know. So she was like, well, where are you doing hair right now? And I was like, well, I don't do hair anymore. I just travel and do makeup. And so she was like, well, I got a suite here for rent if you want to rent one. And I was like, no, I'm good. (laughs) So, you know, got all this pride, all this pride. So maybe a week later, my spirit was like, girl, you know, you don't got nowhere to work and you need some money. So I was like, let me call this girl back. I call her back and I say, hey, you know what? Do you still have that, that suite available? And so she says, yeah, I still have it available. I said, well, listen, here's the thing. I don't have any clients. I don't have any equipment. I don't have any materials. I said, but if you can let me rent your space for $100 a week for a month, then I will be able to pay the $200 a week after that. I just need enough time to get my clientele up. So she was like, yeah, boo, it's no problem. You can come on in, you know, $100 a week. You know, I got you, boo. You know what you need. Will you need anything? But I went to school with her. You know, I was taught not to be taking stuff from people, so I didn't take anything from her. And I started looking on Facebook, and I found a roller cart for $65. And roller carts cost anywhere from $120 to $199. Oh. So I didn't want to pay the $65 because... I mean, I needed it, but I didn't need it like that. And it's used. So I was like, I mean, quarter more dollars. 
I never forget this. My dad transcended this dimension on February the 14th. Okay. The day that I went to meet this guy was February the 14th. It was a misty, it was a light, gentle rain. I will never forget it. The man came from the back with this roller cart. This roller cart was filled with rollers, shears, cutting combs, cutting cakes. He came back with a box full of mannequin heads, full of clippers, shampoo, conditioner, styling books. He said, my mama was a cosmetology instructor and she just died. Oh. I got it all for $65. What? He said, I don't want it. So then you were good. I was good. I opened up the next day. Let me tell you this. I found this quote that you had on Instagram and oh. I loved it because it shows your confidence. And I'm going to read the quote. Let me hear it. Okay. It says, treat your clients like they're royalty. And I promise you that they'll return the favor. I'm guilty of client retention because I listen, I explain, I understand, and I leave room for error in most situations. Why? Yeah. Because I too, like the clients, am human and I'm a client. So I operate in grace with all my clients and potential clients. And that's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> that's why they pay me the big bucks, Shannon. <laughs> And I love that because it's your confidence. It's like, I wish we could bottle it and sell it because you would also make a fortune if you could bottle and sell your confidence and whatever it is that you're manifesting. You know, my confidence comes from my mom. You know, <laughs> listen, black people, we are the funniest people that you will ever meet. Okay. Because my mom... <laughs> My mama had this thing where she would, like, my mom was a total permit, right? She never left the house for nothing. Grocery store, nothing, okay? Church, nothing. She did not leave the house, okay? You could not. She might go to the store to get a pack of cigarettes. Might. <laughs> Inside the house, she's this giant, giant yeah. energy. Growing up, when I started having friends over, like, around about 12, 13, she would gather all my friends around the ottoman. And she would just ask them, oh, well, she did us like this all the time. But my friends, she would be like, on a scale of one to 10, what you write yourself? Like literally in the <laughs> same voice, on a scale of one to 10, what you write yourself? What you write yourself? Oh my God. And you better say 10. Because if you say anything less, <laughs> you wow. got to punch you in your throat, okay? You about to get what you write yourself. Wow. My friends still talk about that to this day. They're like, Miss Williamson, play it for you. better see yourself as the shit. She's going to beat you if you don't. And I'm glad you brought that up too, because you even have it here. Like our listeners can't see it. One of the things that that first night that mom and I met you and we connected on Instagram is that your little tag is Amicia the Great. And you have it here too. And I love that. I love it. So I'm actually a history buff. And I really enjoy, like, the period pieces, the war time. Yeah. I enjoy seeing how land was acquired from any point of view. I watch all the points of view. I love to see it. Napoleon was really a character. <laughs> he was a character for me, honey. And so I remember watching some of his conquests, and I remember just thinking to myself, well, he ain't the last great man. He wasn't <laughs> the only great one. You know, I'm great, yeah. too. And so I kind of, like, took that from Napoleon like I'm great you know <laughs> Amicia the great <laughs> and it has stuck I love it I love it so much and I think you must have archived it or something because I wanted to even play it for this one of the first things I saw of yours was the video <laughs> the video where it's a video or it's a reel or something on Instagram where you are looking at the camera and you're saying something to the effect of you know, if you've got the, and I forgot what you were saying. Oh, I know what like, you're saying. They be mad at me because I really got it. And I really do. Yes. I yes! mean, my hair really is the shit. My skin really <laughs> is popping. I really am smart, like really brilliant. Like I really do got body. Like I really do. And I know it. I love that. And then on that same trip, and I wanted to talk about this too, and I know we're getting long, but I'm not going to take too much more of your time. But I love this was that you and I, and then mom were talking about, there was a business at that same show 
that was just talking about how shitty their business was doing that time. And oh my gosh, they just weren't getting any business. And then yeah. we were talking about how they were just putting out this negative, negative energy. Oh yeah. And you were telling me about it. And then I went over there and I was like, oh my gosh, they really are. And we were both giving them these ideas. And later on, mom went over there and she's like, <laughs> she was telling us, oh my gosh, one was yelling at the other. And I mean, it really is just about all this negativity. So my whole point here is that it's not really even about like, you're not even just trying to be like, oh yeah, I'm the shit. Like I've got all this shit going for me. Like you really put out all this positive stuff and it really is about what you put out. And it really is like the law of attraction. Like you're really, you know, period. Yeah. It really is. Again, I was a negative person and I was a Debbie Downer. I recognized the weight that my opinion carried and I exploited that. If I didn't want to do it, we didn't do it. If I thought it was dumb, everybody thought it was dumb. And But it was always, you know, on the lower rung, on the base side of things. It was never on the higher echelon of thought or, or of being. When I came to realize that I had exactly what I thought I deserved, I had a hard time processing that. But we all have exactly what we deserve. And at the time that I came to that understanding, I had nothing. And I was just like, me? No, I, I deserve more. No, no, you deserve what you work for. And that's what you have. I had to learn the law of attraction as it related to my mind. Because although I would work and hustle and earn all this money, my mind would be, oh, I don't deserve that. You know, maybe that's not for me. That's for them. Or, you know, just really toxic against my own self. And I was not taught to think that way. I began, I think life had hit me so hard and so constantly that I began to think that that's the way that it was for me in this life. And that maybe I was going to have to wait to the, for the next life to yeah. have the things that I deserve. Like maybe I was paying some horrible karmic debt back. Yeah. Or something. What do you do now if someone in your family or your friends or anyone in your life is toxic to you? Do you just cut them off or do you cut them out of your life? Like I have a habit of I just cut, I cut them out. I'm not going to tolerate that shit. I can't handle it. Some people say I cut people off too fast or whatever, I can't mentally or emotionally handle it. So I just cut them off. Like, what do you do? Do you give chances? Are you just like, I'm over it? What do you do? Well, it depends on the person and the offense. I just recently cut somebody out of my life that has been a part of my life for decades. I had to examine why did I allow this energy to continue to come back around? And it was because of vanity. You know, this is my cousin. This is my friend. This is family. You know, but essentially this person is a cancer to self and to others. And so that person I cut and I cut that person because I know that over the years I've been nothing but the best. And then there's absolutely nothing else that I can do for you, but let you go. And then for others, no, I cut their ass. I'm just going to be honest. I don't really have the patience. Like, yeah. I'm in here, the life that I'm manifesting is so much bigger than the nuances of friendship. I figure if the universe, God, so it's the spirit, would have us cross paths, then a goddamn falcon will come to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I'm done. Yeah. With what you've been through now, are you scared of death? Oh, no. So I stopped fearing death when I died. I literally was flying right i had no distinction between flying and walking i did not know that i was flying i just saw trees up under me okay so i know i was flying it did not seem weird to me it did not seem odd to me it did not seem like wow i'm flying i was just traveling through the air i started to see these figures in a clearing and i got closer and the closer i got to these figures I began to recognize them. Even though I didn't know how I recognized them, I was curious as to how I recognized them and I got closer. 
And the closer I got, I recognized that that was my dad and my mom and my sister. And when I looked over, because I was like coming up from behind them. So when I got over them to see what they were looking down at, they were looking down at my casket. And I oh. woke up. And when I woke up, my doctor, his name was Mr. Deer, Dr. Dreary, right? So you remember Grey's Anatomy? He was like, Miss Williams, he was like, we thought we lost you. Just like that. He was like, we thought we lost you. What they told me was a couple things. Because I woke up with the memory of the flying. Two things. They told me that I had control over death because I remember saying no. I remember saying no. Why? Listen, three years later, my daddy died. See, spirit is intelligent. My mom could not have handled losing her husband and one of her kids. That cl- My mama ain't lost nothing. She was dang on 50 when her mama died. Yeah. So she wouldn't have been able to handle that. I don't have a fear of death. Death is an entity like love and joy. And it has its rules. It cannot go above what it's called to do. And if you conquer death, then it has no rule over you. Hmm. I mean, I ain't gonna jump off no building. Or, you know, oh, I know. I know. Riot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have your 10 questions. Call them rapid fire questions, but they're never really that rapid fire. Okay. We're gonna, see. we're gonna see. Okay. Number one is sunrise or sunset? Sunset. Okay. Number two. Go to bed early or sleep in? Sleep in, definitely. Okay. Number three, and because you're in Atlanta, Coca-Cola or Pepsi? Now, you know we got to have our Coke product. Come on. (laughs) See, in North Carolina, we're Pepsi. You know, Pepsi was born in North Carolina, so we like Pepsi here. (laughs) You're going to Coke and Sprite us to death. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay. Number four, do you prefer a client that is late all the time or one that sits in silence in your chair? I take late for 3000 <laughs> At least I know you're coming. Number five, text message or phone call? I prefer text messaging simply because people call me all the time and don't ever want anything. And I just... Yeah. Can't. Yeah, I don't have time for it. Okay, number six, again, a Georgia thing. Do you prefer Georgia peaches or peanuts? Now, you know we got to have peanuts and peaches (laughs) and hot dogs. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, and number seven, I actually did this yesterday, and you answered it for me in a DM this morning. I said coffee or wine. Definitely wine. I hate like, coffee. You said, I hate coffee. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> I hate the way it smells. I grew up smelling coffee like my whole life in the morning. I hate it. Well, it's how like do, you, alarm clock how do you, do you just wake up kind of alert? Do you do anything in the morning to kind of get up and at them? Or are you just kind of. I think it comes from being two of six. You just kind of <laughs> get up, get up, get up. You know? Wow. Okay. And my dad always had an alarm clock. So. I think it's my absolute hatred for alarm clocks. Yeah. That I just don't like anything to jar me out of my sleep. Okay. Number eight, eat in or dine out? That's a 50 50. I know. Am I cheating? No. Number nine, do you prefer someone with good energy or good personality? Energy. Mm hmm. Okay. Good energy. Okay. Personalities are fake. Yep. I agree. Because they could be a good actor. Number 10. This is Jerry's favorite. Ketchup or mustard? Ketchup. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I eat ketchup on collard greens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then this is the most important question. This is what we ask everybody. Is what does a life well lived mean to you? A life well lived means a life filled with memories because in the end that's all you're left with happy memories I think you know you want to create as many positive high vibrational memories as you can 
I think you're totally doing that. And you're giving people happy, positive memories with the energy that you're putting out. I so try. I think my you're doing that. My grandmother, when my grandmother died, man, you could not even pull into the property. She was a school teacher. And I mean, people, their kids and their kids' kids were there. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I want to affect people's lives in that way. I want people to come back 30 and 40 years and say, because of this woman, I did these things. I want to have that said of me when I'm gone over a bottle of scotch. (laughs) Yes. Okay, well, tell our listeners how they can find you. If someone wants to be a client of yours that's treated like royalty, how can they? Well, you can find me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Plat Hair and Skin Bar. Plat, P L A I T, Hair and Skin Bar. And you can just follow the prompt from there, or you can reach out to me, hit me in my DMs, and we'll take care of you if you're mm-hmm. in the Atlanta area. And we're going to link all of that in the show notes so that people can access that too. And we are just so thankful that you are here with us today. Well, was Amicia not absolutely amazing? She really was. I, um, having never met her like you and your mom had, I was... I was pleasantly surprised and uplifted by everything she said. Yeah, I know that was a long episode and I went through it several times, you know, thinking, okay, maybe I can edit out some things. And I just felt like all of it was so important for everyone to hear. There's so many nuggets and pieces of her life and what she's been through. And I feel though all of it is so important when it all comes together to make sense to show. I mean, I I really, and it's like I said in the episode, I really thought she was going to come on, talk about this positive energy and, oh, where does she get it from? And it was going to be these little tips and tidbits. I had no idea the background that she had. All all of that, I I didn't know anything about. So then hearing the background and all the things she had been through and then knowing what a positive person she is, it just meant so much more and so I just, I just left it. Oh, certainly. Yeah. And we've said this about other guests, but it really resonates with Amicia and, and what she said about people coming into your life. Yeah. You know, timing and people's energy happens, you know, for a reason. And Amicia came into mine and my mom's life at the right time. And, you know, timing of when I recorded the episode with her on that day and, even when we're editing the episode and hearing the things she was saying, I mean, you know, you and I, as we were editing, we're going back and forth and going, yeah, you know, it's like we're having a conversation with each other with Amicia too, as we're editing it. It really puts things into perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if this episode resonated with you at all, please share it with a friend and please follow Amicia. And of course her business, we're going to link both of those platforms for you in the show notes. You will be inspired on the daily. Of course, if you're in Atlanta, highly recommend you go and be treated like royalty by her. You will not regret it. My mom and I experienced Uh, her treating us like royalty um, on behalf of her being a makeup artist. And she is absolutely wonderful. As always, you can find us at arneradventures.com on Instagram at arneradventures, also linked in the show notes. So until next time, enjoy the journey that you're on. We're wishing you lots of adventures. Bye. Bye.